through email, mail, and voicemail. We will also take live comments via the phone, and that number is 629-255-1911. However, please hold your call until the project you wish to speak about is announced. And for those who have logged in as panelists, you do not also need to call. At this time, I will take roll call of the commissioners. And when I say your name, please say present. Vice Chair Stewart. Present. Commissioner Fitz. Present. Commissioner Johnson. Present. Commissioner Jones. Present. Commissioner Mayhall. Present. Commissioner Mosley. Present. Commissioner Price. Present. Commissioner Williams. Present. Okay, thank you, commissioners. At this time, also, the commission must vote on the record that the COVID-19 pandemic requires us to hold the telephonic meeting as permitted under the governor's executive order number 60. And I do entertain a motion for this electronic meeting. And Commissioner Jones? Yes, uh, I move that the meeting agenda constitutes essential business of this body and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Thank you, Commissioner. And I see Vice Chair Stewart. I second that motion. Okay, there's a motion, there's a second. And I will take the roll on the motion. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you, Commissioners. Pursuant to the provision of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County via a statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal of public comment. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. Ms. Ziegler, no, raw, no voicemails were received? Correct. Okay, members of the public calling in will be heard. And Ms. Ziegler, again, are there any proposed changes to the agenda? Yes, uh, we once again request to defer the consolidation project. We plan to bring that back to you in March with a decision in April. 201 North 11 has asked to defer, and we'd like to move the case for 1501 Fatherland to the end of the agenda, since Metro League will be joining us a little later. Okay, thank you, Ms. Siegler. And I do entertain, um, oh, is there any discussion about those revisions? And seeing no commissioner raise their hand, I entertain a motion to accept Vice Chair Stewart. Uh, I move to accept the uh, revised agenda. Thank you, and I entertain a second. Vice Chair Jones. I mean, <laughs> sorry, Commissioner Jones. Yes, Commissioner Jones, I second. Okay, thank you. So there's first and a second, and uh, I will call the roll again. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Yes. I think you said yes, is that correct? Yes, I did. Thank you. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay. Um, before we begin our first project, Ms. Ziegler, are there any council members who wish to speak at this time? Let me double check. I didn't see any a few minutes ago. Um, 
No, I do not see any council members on just yet. Okay. And again, first on our agenda is approval of the minutes of January 20, 2021. And does anyone have any comments or revisions of those minutes? Okay. And other than that, I will entertain a motion and Vice Chair Stewart. Uh, I move for approval. Okay. Commissioner Williams. Uh, second the motion. Thank you. And I will take a roll on the motion. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay, thank you, commissioners. <laughs> now is the time for the public to call in if someone would like an item removed from the consent agenda. And that number is 629 255 1911. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Items removed from the consent agenda will be moved to the end of the agenda. Ms. Ziegler, do we have any call-ins? No. Okay, commissioners, do we have any other questions on the consent agenda? Okay, Commissioner Mosley. This isn't on the consent agenda. I don't know if I speak for other commissions. It's a little difficult to hear uh, Mrs. Ziegler on my end. There's a, no, I want to say an echo is just difficult to hear. Okay, duly noted. We'll um, check that out for just a moment. Are any other commit? Um, this is Chair Bell again. Are there any other commissioners that are having issues uh, hearing Robin or myself? This is uh, Commissioner Price. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing Robin as well. Okay. okay. All right. Yes, Commissioner Jones. It, it's as if I hear you fine, uh, Chair Bell, but it's as if Robin is just in the background and not mic'd. Okay. Thank you. Give us just one moment. Thank you for that. We're, we're making some adjustments and hopefully we can um, hear better. Um, I do want to comment for Commissioner Mosley, please um, maybe speak closer to your mic as well. Um, it's uh, you're quieted a little bit there. Okay, I think um, Ms. Sajit will present the consent agenda. Yes. So the first item on the consent agenda is approval of the administrative permits issued for the month. 312 South 11th Street is for an addition with setback determination. The request for 1806 Shelby Avenue is for an addition. 20, 2509 Oakland Avenue is a request for an addition. 1707 Ashwood Avenue is for an addition. The request for 1913 Shelby Avenue is for an addition. An addition is planned at 1410 Dallas Avenue. The project for 3618 Meadowbrook Avenue is an addition and outbuilding. An addition is planned for 117 Windsor Avenue. The project for 407 Greenway Avenue is for an addition. 
alteration of the storefront as well as signage are planned for 116 3rd Avenue South. Um, the request for 1822 Fifth Avenue North is for an addition. An addition is planned at 1223 Villa Place. An addition, outbuilding, and partial demolition are planned for 1209 Elmwood Avenue. And finally, the request for 1239 Plymouth Avenue is for an addition. Staff recommends uh, approval of these projects along with their applicable conditions as noted in the staff reports. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Sajit. Ms. Siegler, are there any calls in for removal of the any from the consent agenda? No, there are no calls. Okay. Commissioners? Any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Mayhall? I move to approve the consent agenda. Okay, there is a motion by and Commissioner Price. I second the motion. Okay, there's a first and a second, and I will take the roll on the motion. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Thank you. And Commissioner Mosley, we do hear you better. Thank you so much. Okay, as a reminder, uh, those who are applicants for any case or representing applicants who received emails to participate as a panelist should not also call in. If you are unable to log in or are not a panelist, please call the number 629-255-1911. When the case you are interested in speaking about comes up, now is the time for someone to call, for those people to call if they have public comment. Also regarding the proposed Haynes Heights Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Yes, this is a request for Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay for the Haynes Heights Neighborhood. It was developed by and for African Americans during the Jim Crow era. The Haynes Heights Neighborhood was populated by doctors, lawyers, and educators, among many others. Haynes Heights allows members of the, allowed members of the black community the type of neighborhood that they envisioned for themselves and their family, one that was not available to them in established neighborhoods of segregated Nashville. The Haynes Heights neighborhood remains intact and largely unchanged. Many of the homes are contributing resources to the National Register eligible district with very few demolitions, new construction, or major alterations. The lot still includes large front yards and there have been minimal subdivision of property. The values and goals of early residents to create their own family oriented middle to upper class oasis in a world of segregation and racism remains embodied in the physical layout and architecture of this neighborhood. Um, and I want to thank um, Victoria Hensley and uh, the Center for Historic Preservation at Middle Tennessee State University for putting together this history for us. And based on that history, staff finds that the proposal meets criteria one and three of section 17.36.120. We also find that the draft design guidelines meet the Secretary of Interior standards. And anticipating that the consolidated guidelines will be approved in April, you'll see that these are a new set of what we hope to be consolidated guidelines for the very different architecture and development of a later mid-century development such as this one. But if the consolidation does not pass, then this set of design guidelines can just be reformatted to be for Haynes Heights only without changing any of the guidelines themselves. Okay, thank you, Ms. Siegler. I'd like to ask if Council Member Toombs is on the line. She is. Oh, yes. I, okay. I am. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to speak now? Sure, thank you. Um, I I just wanted to speak in support of this um, conservation zone and overlay for the Haynes Heights neighborhood. Uh, it is a historic uh, neighborhood that has remained unchanged as was stated in the presentation. Uh, one of my goals as a, the councilwoman of a district that has not seen a lot of development, uh, but there's a significant amount of development on the horizon is that even with that development, my goal is to protect historic and established neighborhoods and Haynes Heights is one of our historic neighborhoods that means a lot to the community and it means a lot to the neighbors. 
uh, who live in that community that their neighborhood remain the way it is um, untouched by any uh, uh, any type of development. So I am wholeheartedly in favor of this uh, conservation zone and overlay to protect this historic neighborhood. Thank you, Thank you, council member. And we do appreciate your efforts as well with the neighborhood. And um, I think um, we might have some public comment uh, but again, thank you for your efforts and also those that have um, submitted their um, um, this proposal and recommendation. Ms. Siegler? I know, I can see that Quinta Martin is on the line okay. and she may be representing the neighborhood. Okay. Ms. Martin, please uh, announce yourself and you have you have the voice. Thank you, Chairman Bell. Chairman Bell, members of the Metro Historical Zoning Commission and members of the community. I am Quinta Martin, the president of the Haynes Heights Neighborhood Association and reside at 643 West Nocturne Drive in District 2. I have lived on and off at this residence since 1919, 1962. I will be brief. I come before you today seeking your approval of our application for an historic conservation zoning overlay for the Haynes Heights community. We are located north of the river and west and west Trinity Lane, east of Bordeaux Buena Vista, and west of White's Creek Pike. Our community was established in the early 1950s due to segregation. It was not until the 1970s that black middle class medical and legal professionals, educators, and business owners of Nashville were allowed to buy, build, or live in the white communities of their peers, thus seeking a safe and family suitable area in which to live, our parents and grandparents blazed the trail of developing plots of woodlands in the Nashville outskirts of Davidson County. They chose an area of the county supported by the historic visions of Reverend William Hayes, who developed the homestead community of Haynes Heights. With the support of sales manager Robert Mann and several black general contractors, homes were built on one and two acre lots. These two to three bedroom, one bathroom Southern style homes were phase one in the 1950s. Phase two in the 1960s saw the development's growth into three to four bedroom, two to three bath ranch and split ranch homes with full basements and attached garages on two to four acre lots. And phase three in the 1970s rounded out the subdivision with larger four to five bedroom, three ba bathroom ranch and modern homes on even larger lots. For years, the 125 homeowners and residents of Haynes Heights have planned, executed, and communicated the desire to preserve the quality of life established by the neighborhood originators. We have proudly maintained the res residential structures and the surrounding properties. We have cons conserved the surrounding richly forested areas teeming with wildlife. And we have cultivated neighborhood public areas, such as a three acre stormwater retention pond to become the jewel lake of, and park of the neighborhood. Haynes Heights is a peaceful, safe, friendly, and diverse community. Neighbors look out for one another and neighbors help one another. Our neighborhood has a very rich African-American history of residents who helped shape Nashville into what it is today. The Haynes Heights Neighborhood Association was formed in 2017 out of the need to lead the efforts to guide the maintenance of that quality of life and to liaison or represent the community with the city and others where needed. Thus the Haynes Heights Executive Board spearheaded the recognition of the community as an historic district of the city. Acknowledging that implementation of city planning efforts, such as Nashville Next to Name One in particular, 
will have a significant impact on the surrounding areas of our community, the homeowners asked the association leadership to research and lead efforts to protect the quality of life we know and love. Development is all around us. Daily and sometimes multiple times daily, we receive marketing calls soliciting sales of our homes and property. We are wary of unscrupulous efforts to secure properties from our elderly and from families of our recently deceased. Looking around in other neighborhoods of Nashville, we can see how communities without design guidelines and zoning overlay designations have suffered. Suffered with the splitting of lots and building of multiple residences on less than one acre. Suffered with building of residences out of character with the current home's design. Suffered with building multifamily properties via spe specific planning rezoning designations within communities. The inclusion of short-term rental properties within the neighborhood via non-homeowner loophole, loopholes are another way neighborhoods have suffered. The homeowners of Haynes Heights overwhelmingly support this application for an historic conservation zoning overlay. For over three years, we have researched the various types of zoning overlays and determined that this overlay designation is the best one for our community. We met with the National Historic Commission, Historical Commission, met with the council members, and met with communities with historic zoning overlays. In our last survey, a 99% response of our community was in favor of this zoning overlay designation. We have, you have received letters of support for our application from many of our very actively involved homeowners. We hope and ask that you favorably consider our request for this designation and grant the historic zoning overlay to our community. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Quinta Martin. We appreciate the Haynes Heights Neighborhood Association's efforts and also working with the council member and with our Metro Historic uh, Zoning um, staff. So again, thank you for your well done presentation. And Ms. Ziegler, do we have any other public comment? As Ms. Martin noted, I just wanted to say that you received 15 letters in support and one in opposition, and we do not have any callers. Okay. With that, Council member, do you have any other comments before I close public hearing? No, I don't, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate, again, all the efforts, and it's uh, really uh, commendable to have um, this designation of a historic area and historic neighborhood. So I will close public hearing, and we will have discussion and comments by the commission, and I do see Commissioner Williams' hand is raised. Yeah. I just want to um, commend them on the work it took to get this overlay before us today. Uh, Haynes Heights um, is, a, is a, a neighborhood that reflects the black struggle for equality during Jim Crow segregation. Um, every home that remains standing there is a testament to the contractors who applied their skills to erect homes that would stand. Um, this is an important space in the city and I, I just want to rise to commend, the, commend them for their work. Um, I applaud um, Haynes High Community. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Jones. Yes, um, I definitely second everything that uh, Commissioner Williams just said, and just wanted to ask since you know we have a few new uh, new members and um, on our commission, and we, you know we don't do these new overlays that often. Um, normally. And again, this might be for the difference between the historic overlay and the neighborhood conservation overlay. 
uh, we get a report of, you know, the numbers uh, and, you know, addresses and percentages that are contributing versus non-contributing. Um, if maybe uh, Robin could um, fill me in on that, I just, or if I missed something, uh, again, it, it said it's largely unchanged, so perhaps it's a hundred percent, um, but just wanted to ask about that. This is Robin. You're right. I'm sorry. I should have included that. I don't have the exact number, but I can tell you it's extremely high. It's probably one of the highest of the districts that we have. It's there's almost nothing that would be considered non-contributing. Does that help? Right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I was just wondering. You know. Uh. You know. As this goes to council, um. You know that I think is an important piece of information of how, um you know, consolidated this area is in, in, in the contributing way. So that's that's great. Good question. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would like to echo uh, previous uh, commissioners and big applaud and hats off to uh, people in the neighborhood. I could tell they have been working so hard to accomplish this goal. And I read all the comments that came from the neighborhood in support. And although uh, there was one opposition, uh, even opposition seems like uh, some clarification or misunderstanding of uh, material uh, to be used when uh, repair is needed or addition may apply in the future. So in a sense, it's not a really opposition. So uh, big hats off to the neighborhood and the staff to uh, bring it to this stage. And I am a uh, big O and in support. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair. Uh, yes, I, I again want to uh, to applaud Ms. Martin and the entire community for uh, coming together and doing the amazing amount of work it takes to to get uh, these documented and uh, and get the amount of support that they did. Uh, it's an important part of our history and certainly one that we need to to tell and to to remember and recognize. I think this is a great move toward that, and I would like for uh, to move for uh, move for approval of the Haynes Heights Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Stewart. And this is um, our commission uh, makes the recommendation um, to Metro Council for approval. Sure. So I'll amend my motion then to recommend the council for approval. Vice Chairman, this is Robin Ziegler. Does that also include an adoption of the design guidelines? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for clarification. Okay. So, um, Commissioner Price. Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to add one more comment to this uh, very exciting um, uh, new overlay uh, in Nashville, and uh, want to thank the neighborhood association and councilwoman for representing it. I also wanted to just add a, another comment. If I'm not mistaken, this is also our first mid-century conservation overlay or historic district overlay. In Nashville, uh, composed of ranch and other mid-century forms, which I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. So that's also another exciting level of this, and I hope to see more of that um, in Nashville as we go forward. So I just wanted to add that comment, and also, uh, unless there are other other comments or discussion, I'll second um, uh, Cyril's motion. Yes, thank you. Yes, duly noted that it is our first mid-century. I am getting a nod from. Um, Metro Historic Zoning staff, and um, hopefully we will get more of those. Um, so <laughs> Haynes Heights, you have made a precedence for um, our commission. And again, we, we cannot um, give you more, <laughs> more praise on, on how this is going through. And we do want to, I'm sure Council Member Toombs will um, bring to the, uh, to the uh, Metro Council that um, of approval for this for this um, neighborhood conservation uh, zoning overlay. Um, other commissioners have any other comments? There was a first and a second. Um, other than that, we will take a motion or vote for the motion. Yes, okay. All right, I'll take the roll call. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. 
Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner Williams. Yes. Okay. Thank you, commissioners. Now is the time for the next for anyone to call on the, our next project, and that is at 945 South Douglas Avenue, Unit 1. Let me ask a question to the staff. We do have three of those. Do we just do each one? Okay, we will do each one then. Uh, the first one on that is Unit 1, and again, that number to call in is 629-255-1911, and Ms. Warren will be our presenter. Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Great. Okay. In 2018, the commission approved an SP for the site at 945 South Douglas. 19 houses are planned for development. The commission approved specific ridge and E pipes and widths for each unit and recommended approval to the planning commission. The SP was approved. Now the applicant will return to this commission for final design approval for each unit. Today they are presenting units one through three. Unit one sits at the corner of the development and will be one of the largest houses here. It was approved to be two stories tall with a 35 foot ridge and 19 foot eight inch eaves. The width could be 40 feet. The proposed structure meets these parameters for massing. Staff finds that the proposal is appropriate in terms of height, massing, materials, and roof. It is consistent with the site plan approved for the SP. Staff's only issue is the turret, which is a high style Victorian element, which staff finds to be inappropriate to the context. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed house with the conditions that the turret be removed, that staff shall approve materials, and that the utility locations be approved. The applicant is here and would like to speak. Okay, thank you, Ms. Warren. And applicant, please announce yourself. Hi, my name is Martin Wick. I'm at 912 Bailey Street, and I'm the architect for this project. Um, thank you. It's a wanted to start out by saying that we uh we really appreciate all of the work that staff has put in on this with us so far um been a lot of emails and video calls and even uh in-person meetings back when we could do those um so it's been a bit it's been a long process and their feedback has been very helpful uh, in finding something that can meet the developers needs and also fit well within um, this historic neighborhood we're very happy with the recommendation uh, for approval and just quickly wanted to address the, the first condition about removing the turret. Um, while I would normally agree with staff's analysis regarding the context for say a single infill house, um, this is a 19 unit development uh, in a neighborhood that has very little two story historic context remaining. Um, one of the main comments that the design team took away from the initial SP submission back in 2018 was to bring as much variety to this site as possible. Uh, both staff and the commission asked us to do that. Um, and several commissioners in that meeting were even concerned about putting specific height restrictions on this project uh, as they thought it would give us a target rather than letting us design each house to be appropriate to its style. Um, if you've looked through the, the next couple of submissions for unit two and three, uh, you can see that our plan is to have a, a variety of styles and that we're not planning to max out uh, every single house or anything like that. Um, so our main goal with this first unit is to help bring variety to this site. Uh, Victorian houses with turrets are certainly prominent uh, in say the Edgefield neighborhood as the staff recommendation mentioned, um, but they're not limited to it uh, and nor are they limited to high style Victorian houses. Um, so here I've got uh, a couple of slides of different houses in different areas. Um, this first one is all in uh, in East Nashville, the Lachlan Springs uh, East End neighborhood, a variety of one and two story houses with different um, detailing, whether it's brick uh, or sort of the shingles, um, it's very, you know, different roof styles and things like that. If you can go to the next slide for me as well. Uh, as well. Um, these are houses in Belmont Hillsboro. Uh, 1501 Linden and 1507 Linden with two very different sort of styles of design and materials. Um, and then I think I have one more set of pictures as well, uh, which is the Woodland and Waverly uh, neighborhood with, again, two very different um, houses, different styles, different material materials, different heights for uh, the towers there. 
Um, so as I was saying, it's not difficult to find houses with turrets and towers uh, in other neighborhoods and on a variety of houses um, with varying eave heights and roof shapes. Being limited uh, to the two or three remaining historic styles around this development at 945 South Douglas uh, goes against the commission's request to bring more variety to this site. And in this particular situation, I think we should be allowed a greater leeway in pulling from historic precedents, uh, not just in the immediate vicinity, but in the greater context of the neighborhoods around us. Um, and I just also wanted to mention lastly, uh, a lack of this style of houses currently in the neighborhood does not necessarily mean that they did not exist in this neighborhood at some point in time. Um, specifically, this house uh, at 754 Benton that's on the current slide. Um, while it currently stands in Woodland and Waverly, uh, that house was built in the Waverly Belmont neighborhood and was actually physically moved out of it. Um, so while we can sit here and speculate about how many houses maybe used to be in the neighborhood, this one is a specific example of a two-story high style Victorian that used to stand uh, near our site. Um, so we are pulling directly from the historic precedents uh, of this neighborhood to inspire these designs for our new development. Um, so again, just for the sake of a variety on this site uh, and in considering the larger historic context in the area, uh, we do believe that the turret is, is an appropriate piece uh, on this design. Um, and I thank you for your time and consideration on this. Thank you, Mr. Wick. Okay. Do we have any public comment calling in? Yeah. Okay, we do not. So we will close public hearing and now into commission discussion. Commissioner Mosley. Yeah, I have a question for the architect, if, if I may. Sure. Do <clears throat> I appreciate your the research um, that you've done, and I can add to your list that uh, maybe not the only, but Germantown has um, certainly not a homogenous district, and, and also has some turrets and, and examples. I think of I don't know if it's necessarily half style Victorian, but some turreted um, elements, you know, in, in kind of packed into a, a small, small little little facade there. So I appreciate the thought that was put into that. Here's my question. Is this an element um, that is particular to, you know, considering the development as a whole and some of the points that you've made about Commissioner's comments about creating this homogenous sort of pocket with all these homes uh, on this lot. Um, is this in your mind specific to this lot or will there be flourishes at multiple locations in the way that you're planning, master planning the site? Um, yeah, the, the plan is certainly to try to make uh, the architecture sort of of each unit respond to the site. So this one in particular being on the corner, um, I don't know if we want to go back to the, the site plan, just to quickly look at that. Um, but it's, you know, it's the corner of the lot. It's, uh, it faces up 10th. It's, we have two two story houses that were, we were told to design by, um, by the commission. So unit one and then unit eight on the other side will kind of do a similar, uh, you know, it'll kind of be a similar entrance piece coming up South Douglas. So the turret sort of on that corner facing out, um, is, is certainly specific to this lot in that it, it's kind of an entry point to the, the development. Um, we also have units three and four that sort of surround that public access point to the middle of the lot. Uh, unit three we'll look at in a, in a moment also has sort of a piece that addresses that corner. Um, so yeah, we, we are trying to take the architecture of the overall site and sort of address the area around us with these pieces um, to, to bring that, like, you, as you said, these flourishes to kind of bring some variety, uh, and to address, not just the development, but this sort of the greater context around us. And I, I appreciate your comments. I, I, that helps to understand. I, I think we, we try, uh, both on the regulatory side, sometimes with more success than others, and certainly, uh, you know, on the design side, um, in creating, um, the multiple layers of history and things that are built at different times is a dangerous game. And um, 
so I'll be interested to see that, and, and I'm certainly open to your arguments for um, doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Thank you, applicant. Commissioners, any other comments? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I do appreciate uh, applicant uh, reasoning behind the introduction of tariff, and especially uh, putting the two pictures from uh, Belmont, uh, Waverly Belmont uh, neighborhood area is very helpful because I was under the impression all this tariff is, uh, of course, historical uh, feature, but uh, I was under the impression that Waverly Belmont neighborhood area does not have uh, those features. So that uh, it is very helpful. So my question to uh, staff is uh, having tariff will be a little bit higher than uh, the height allowed. So if we were, as a commission, leaning towards accepting tariff, uh, how does uh, uh, correlate with the height limitation? Sure, this is Jenny Warren. That's a good question. Um, and I think it's spelled out a little bit more clearly in your report, but I wasn't clear in my presentation. The height of the turret, Melissa, maybe we can skip back to the front elevation. Um, there we go. So, oh, <laughs> there it is. Okay, so the height of the turret, I think it was 3410, Martin can probably tell me, uh, but it was just under that 35 foot max. Um, so the ridge height is, is well under the 35 foot max and even the tip of the turret is lower than, um, than the maximum height permitted. Great, thank you for the information. It's very helpful. Sure. Thank you. Other commissioners? Commissioner Mosley? I'd, I'd like to hear maybe a, a little more, uh, if the staff has um, some more analysis of, or, or is it a, is the objection to the turret that it's a contextual or well not a conjectural element that it's it's not a it's not appropriate based on um, I, I just I'd like to hear a little little bit more about is it a, a form based argument or or is this that it is a conjectural insertion that is deemed not uh, appropriate to the um, the project and, and or is it a matter of mass and size and scale or both or none? <laughs> sure, this is Jenny Warren again. Um, we are we as Martin said at the beginning of his presentation. We have worked with them extensively on this unit in particular, and we are happy where the massing has landed. So we're not opposed to the massing necessarily. Our issue is more that we felt like the turret kind of pushed. Um, the overall design into a really high style Victorian form, which just isn't something that you see there. Um, the turret was really kind of, as I said, the, the one thing that we didn't agree on. So we wanted to bring that to you and let the commission discuss it and, and see how you felt about it. Um, and I know Martin feels that this is going to be kind of one of their showpiece homes. And I know he just spoke about how this one's going to be, be a little bit more high style than some of the others we might see was their intention. We just felt like the removal of the turret would make it um, a little less high style and make it fit into the neighborhood a little bit better. Sure. Uh, I, um, in the absence of its um, um, of it being a high style element, I'm, I'm I have some concern about um, sometimes it's a delicate balance to have something that you don't push so far that you create so many little things that they all compete for attention. A very difficult thing in, in a multi-unit development um, that some of the common elements they're not different enough, and it, it looks like you're sort of playing Legos and picking one piece off and, and putting it on another. And that's not a criticism of of, of this plan, but a, of just the difficulty as a designer and as an architect to to be able to do that. I, uh, and I hate to use this word organically, but that it not look forced maybe is a good way to describe it. And I'm not. Uh, 
saying that this looks forced, I, I, the, the, all of them together will be, you know, will be judged both individually and as a group. And, and I'm on its own, this element is not um, offensive or, or contrasting greatly. I, I am interested in, and certainly can have some um, concern about constructability and form resolution, not in the way that it's drawn as much as in the way that it's constructed um, and, and the kind of care and, and attention to detail that would be required to pull off some of those roof forms, especially with, uh, um, I, I don't see the, not on this slide, you can't see it, but if it's a shingle roof, um, that's, that's a, it's a lot uh, to ask of, <laughs> of a, uh, of, of a roofer these days in, in terms of the care that's taken to do that. But I, I have no doubt that they'll, they'll um, do their best to, to give the appropriate direction to pull that off. If the other commissioners, um, or if this commission feels like that element may be appropriate and, and that remains to be seen. Thanks for your additional comments. Commissioner, this is Robin Ziegler. Also just wanted to add that so far we haven't used the context in other neighborhoods um, we've even tried not to use the context within a single neighborhood that's fairly far away. We've been trying to keep the context fairly close. So I just wanted to point that out to you. Do our other architects have any comments? I'd like to hear from you on that. Commissioner Fitz. Um, yes, thank you. I was just going to mention that um, I guess I feel that the applicant makes a compelling argument while the form is not widespread throughout this overlay, um, that there is the occurrence, you know, even in a few locations, um, I guess help, helps me to to, I guess, to validate its use, um, especially as a distinguishing factor um, in this multi-unit development. So I, um, I understand where the staff is coming from, but I also feel like the applicants made a, made a compelling argument. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. Commissioner Jones? Yes, just, you know, I've agreed, you know, everything that other commissioners have said, taking that, you know, into account. And, uh, you know, so I, while we do, you know, it was requested and I think, you know, necessary to have that variety of looks um, that uh, Mr. Wick was was referencing, and, and that is true. Um, you know, and I try to think of it as not only in the scope of the whole, you know, development of the several homes, but also just this one, you know, so if I were to just see this one um, come up, um, you know, like, uh, while I am sweat, you know, his presentation, um, I thought was very well done. And and I agree with Commissioner Fitz. And then on the other hand, I'm also struggling, you know, if, if we've ever, you know, had the, a turret again, because it is that high style um, in this neighborhood. So I'm kind of going back and forth uh, on my side. Um, well, well, again, and I agree with Commissioner Mosley, it's not particularly offensive to me. It's, you know, whether it fits in the guidelines and, you know, for the context, immediate context that we like to use, you know, for this neighborhood, so. That's uh, currently what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Stewart. But, you know, this is one I'm sorry to be late in weighing in. I was on Google Earth looking at the other houses on the street. <laughs> I didn't visit the site when this first came before the commission just to get the context of what the neighborhood was like, but I wanted to refresh that. 
when I look at that neighborhood and, and the houses that are immediately visible from the site, uh, what I see is, is a wide, wide variety of homes from, you know, very recent, very contemporary uh, high density homes to uh, small, you know, 50s and 60s homes. And then at least one that are a couple that are from uh, the period that this architecture would suggest. Uh, one of those being, you know, very well detailed and uh, and and more hostile than uh, than than the others. Uh, I think that here uh, the developers tried to do something that relates to the neighborhood. I, I agree with Ms. Ziegler that that we we don't necessarily take things from uh, East Nashville or Belmont and move them over to this neighborhood uh, and use that as a precedent. But I do think that in this case the uh, the, the turret is not so overstated uh, as to uh, call undue attention to itself. And it will help to differentiate this unit one from the, the more than a dozen more units that will be planned for this site. So, uh, so I, I too uh, am, am uh, although on the fence, uh, leaning toward uh, being more permissive uh, for this particular site and this particular development. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Mosley. Um, unless there's, if there's a need for further discussion, it certainly can be. Um, but with that, I'll move approval of 945 South Douglas Avenue, Unit 1, um, with staff conditions accepting Item 1, finding that um, the design meets the guidelines um, for intent and noting specifically that this um, unit with the corner turret um, is appropriate in that it is a, a unit that is on the corner on the end and uh, therefore you know would be by its location a little more architecturally significant than perhaps others would be and uh, i'll leave it at that thanks commissioner vice chair uh, i'll second that motion Okay, we have a first and we have a second and we will take the roll. Let's see how this fares out. Okay, yes or no, Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. And Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. Now is the time for uh, public to call in uh, the 945 South Douglas Unit 2, that number 629-255-1911, and Ms. Warren will again present this project. Yep, now we are moving on to Unit 2 right next door. This unit was approved at one and a half stories, with a maximum ridge height of 32 feet, an e height of 12 feet, and a width of 34 feet. The proposed height is several feet lower at about 29 feet 6 inches. Staff finds that the proposal is appropriate in terms of height, massing, materials, and roof form. It is consistent with the site plan approved for the SP. Staff's only issue is the use of wall dormers on the side elevations. The design guidelines for Waverly Belmont only allow wall dormers on greater elevations. The commission has been consistent in requiring that side dormers have a two foot inset from the wall below. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed house with the condition that the dormers be inset two feet, that staff shall approve materials and that utility locations shall be approved. Okay, thank you, Ms. Warren. And applicant. Yes, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Mark Wick again, at, um, or at 912 Bailey Street and the architect. Uh, so the, um, we're again, we're happy with this recommendation uh, for approval with the conditions and just wanted to briefly talk about that first one. Um, and uh, as you can already see on this picture, um, the argument really comes down to pretty much the same thing that we talked about on unit one. We're looking for ways to bring, uh, you know, some additional variety to this site. And we're kind of looking around the neighborhood for um, designs uh, in different different ways that historically houses have handled um, sort of these one and a half story houses. 
Uh, and this one just up the street at 824 South Douglas has uh, some historic wall dormers on it. Um, and so we're kind of taking some cues from this. We're doing a similar uh, sort of craftsman style, um, you know, brick on the first floor. Uh, I think we just have siding on the second floor. Um, but, uh, you know, for the sake of variety, we're kind of looking for elements that maybe they're like kind of like the turret. Maybe they're only on one of the houses on the lot, but it's something that kind of helps to set that house apart. Um, and so on, in this case, it's a, it's a wall dormer sort of further back on the house. Um, and so that's we, why we included it. We wanted to see what the commission's thoughts on that were. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, the commission for discussion. Anybody there? Yeah, I've lost oh. audio. I hear you, Ben. Oh, oh, so sorry. Oh, Manet was on uh, mute again. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, trying to minimize the sound here. Uh, Commissioner Price, I am so sorry. That's okay. Uh, Commissioner Stewart actually had his hand up first, I believe. He might have had a delay. Either either one. We'll we'll call both okay. of you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, so again, I, I respect and acknowledge what the uh, applicant's doing with uh, with this project. And, however, we've been pretty hard and fast with uh, requiring that dormers be inset two feet. So I tend to agree with staff recommendations on this project on the, their recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair. Mr. Price. Uh, yes, this is a question for Mr. Wick. Um, I'm curious to know if the dormer position, as you've designed it, is critical for interior space or programming of the building, or do you just want it on the wall? If that makes sense. Um, this one, actually, the, the second floor isn't, isn't fully designed. Um, it's it, it wouldn't necessarily be critical no it really was more for kind of the design element um and to kind of see you know with these first few houses there are, there are things where we're kind of wanting to see what what we can what we can do what the commission thinks is appropriate for the site and, and so it's kind of it's part of that kind of exploration um and so it's not necessarily critical for, for the interior space. I see. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I need to, need to agree with uh, Vice Chair Stewart and our um, standard practice precedent of holding the design guidelines for two foot inset. So thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? We can entertain a motion. Vice Chair. Uh, Madam Chairman, with respect to 945 South Douglas Avenue, Unit 2, I move for approval uh, with the staff conditions. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Williams. I second the motion. Okay, there's the first and second. I will take the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you. The motion passes. And now it's time for the public to call in on 945 South Douglas Avenue, Unit 3. 
And that number is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Warren, you have the voice. Yes, we are moving on to unit three right next door. Like unit two, this unit was approved at one and a half stories, the maximum ridge height of 32 feet and an eave height of 12 feet. The width here was approved at 40 feet. Please note the clipped gables on the main roof floor. The wrong elevation was included in the body of your report. The gables will be clipped as indicated here and in the set of plans that were attached to the report. The proposed height meets all the parameters. Staff finds that the proposal is appropriate in terms of height, massing, materials, and roof form. It is consistent with the site plan approved for the SP and there are no design issues. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of this house with the standard conditions as seen here. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Applicant? Uh, yep, this is Martin Wick again, I told Bailey Street, uh, the architect. Um, we're happy with the, the recommendation for approval here. Um, we're happy with the way we've kind of worked through this one as well with, with staff and found something that um, everyone can, can agree on. So we're, we're happy to move forward with this one. Very good, thank you. Ms. Ziegler, do we have any public comment? We do not. Okay, we will close public hearing. Commissioners, any discussion or entertain a motion? Vice Chair Stewart. Uh, Madam Chairman, I uh, recommend that uh, with respect to this project, to 945 South Douglas Avenue, Unit 3, that I move for approval with staff conditions. Thank you. Commissioner Mayhall? I second that motion. Okay, thank you. And we'll take the roll for the motion. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now again, it's a time for the public to call on 150 Windsor Drive, and that number is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Baldock, we welcome you to present the project. Sorry about that. Can everybody hear me now? Yes, ma'am. 150 Windsor Drive was constructed in 1954. In 2017, MHCC determined after a survey of the neighborhood that the existing house in the lot is non-contributing because its ranch form does not meet the predominant historic house form in the Bellmead Links neighborhood. Also in 2017, MHCC approved adding a one half story addition on top of the ranch house, which was akin to constructing infill in the lot because the overall height, scale, roof form, and style of the house would have changed. That addition was never built. This application is for a different infill design from what was approved in 2017. The application is to demolish the existing structure and construct infill. Here is the site plan. The proposed infill meets all base zoning setbacks and its front setback meets the historic context. The applicant proposes an attached garage with the garage doors facing the right side of the lot. The design guidelines state that attached garages can be appropriate when they are typical when they are a typical feature of the neighborhood. Staff found that looking at the 1954, 1957, sorry, Sanborn map, that there were several houses in the overlay that had attached garages, although many of these were front facing one bay garages that have since been filled in to be conditioned space. Bellamy Links still develops later than many other conservation overlays in Nashville, with many houses dating from the 1930s and 1940s when automobile ownership was more common, which is why so many houses had attached garages. In this case, staff finds that the proposed attached garage meets the design guidelines because there were several historic attached garages in the overlay and because the garage doors face the side of the street, not the front, and they are pushed towards the back of the house where they will be less visible. Here is the front facade. The infill will be one and a half stories and 27 feet tall, which meets the context. It has a width of about 62 feet, um, but that's the entire total width. Um, just that main form of the taller portion is 45, 44 feet wide, which helps to reduce its massing. Here are the side facades. Staff, staff finds that the infill's roof forms, materials, and orientation all meet the design guidelines. Here's the rear facade. And here are some context photos. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the inform, infill with the um, conditions seen here on the screen. Oh. 
Ms. Baltock? Yes. Are you, oh, are, so, are you finished? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we, we're recommending approval with the conditions that you see here on the screen. Okay, got you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to be quick. <laughs> okay, yes, you were quick. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I believe the applicant is online. Please announce yourself. Applicant? Hmm. It, yeah. We, we think it's Jeff Steele and you are unmuted. However, we do not hear you. Okay. I think you're calling back in. One moment. The applicant is trying to patch in. Applicant, at just any time, we are we're on standby. Mr. Steele, are you on the line? Thank you very much. So I do apologize. I'm Jeff Steele at 42 Win Oak, and I uh, approved the staff's comments. Do you have any questions for me? Okay. We'll give it just a moment, and thank you for uh, calling in again. So yeah. thank you for the efforts there. <laughs> we may have some uh, questions for you, so hang on. Okay. okay. Uh, do we have any other public comments? We do not. Okay. We have no other call-ins. So there is no rebuttal on that. We will close public hearing and commissioners, any comments, questions? Yes, Vice Chair Stewart. You know, I think this is a, a, a modest but very well done uh, house that fits into the context of this neighborhood and, uh, and will be an improvement and appreciate the architect's attention to uh, making it compatible with what's there. So uh, with, with that said, I uh, move for approval uh, with uh, staff conditions. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Price? Yes, I second the motion. Okay, there's the first as a second. I guess, uh, uh, applicant, we have no questions at this moment, so uh, we're all good. Um, and I will take the roll, commissioners. Vice Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Fitz?
probably trying to say yes, but we're not hearing. <laughs> Commissioner Fitz, you might be on mute. Okay, I'll come back to you. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. And Commissioner Fitz? Apologies about that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the motion passes. So thank you all. And now is the time for the public to call in for 407 South 10th Street. That number again is 629-255-1911. And Ms. Warren will be our presenter. Yes. The commission approved new two-story duplex infill structures on either side of this lot last year. The applicant is proposing to construct the same design that was approved next door at number 405 South 10th Street here on this lot. South 10th Street marks the western boundary of the overlay. The subject lot is on the east side of 10th Street between Fatherland Street and Shelby Avenue. As you can see, the entire east side of this block consists of non-contributing ranch houses. And across the street in the Edgefield Historic Preservation Overlay, the buildings are also all non-contributing here. There is no historic context on this block. As such, in 2019, the commission approved this duplex infill on the same block at number 307. Here's the front elevation of the proposed structure. The massing is identical to what was approved before. Because this exact plan has been approved right next door, staff suggests that the applicant differentiate the design of the second structure by changing some of the materials. The applicant has indicated a willingness to work with staff by changing the secondary cladding material and by alter altering the design and materials of the front porches. Here are the side elevations, again, identical to what was approved before. The application includes two modest one-story garages at the rear, which meet all the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the application with the conditions on the screen and in your report. I believe the applicant is here and wanted to speak briefly. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Applicant, please announce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you and would like to say thank you for to Jenny and Melissa and everybody that's worked with us on and, uh, getting these plans correct. Let me backtrack correct. on that, applicant. Uh, please, just please uh, an announce your name so we're for sure on, on record. Sure. This is Doug Schenkel, uh, address 6121 Nolensville Pike. Thank you. And and continue. Agree. I'm sorry to, to interject. It's okay. I should have known to do that. Um, <laughs> and I agree with all the staff recommendations. Very good. Thank you for working with staff as well. Ms. Ziegler, any public comment? No public comment. Okay, we will close public hearing and have any questions and discussions from the commission or a motion. Okay, Commissioner Mayhall. Uh, saying that everybody's in agreement, I'll uh, recommend that we uh, we go with staff recommendations for 150 uh for excuse me for 407 south 10th street okay thank you commissioner commissioner johnson yes thank you i second the motion okay there's a first a second i will take the roll vice chair stewart yes commissioner fitz yes commissioner johnson yes commissioner jones yes Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you, commissioners. Now, uh, next project is 1016 15th Avenue South. And again, the public can call in to 629-255-1911. And Ms. Warren, again, will be our presenter. Okay, the existing house at 1016 15th Avenue South does not contribute to the Edge Hill Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Staff has issued a demolition permit administratively. The application is to construct a new single family house and a deck. 
The historic context features houses that range in height from 19 to 37 feet. The proposed two-story house is appropriate in height at about 28 feet. The even foundation heights are also appropriate. The widths of the historic two-story houses in this context range from about 28 feet to about 33 feet. This house is proposed to be just under 37 feet wide. While some of the one or one and a half story houses are this wide, none of the two stories are. Staff is concerned that a two story house this wide will have an overall massing that exceeds anything in the context. As such, staff recommends that the width of the house be reduced to be no more than 32 to 33 feet wide. The additional width also impacts the appropriate rhythm of spacing, which narrowing the house would also correct. The front setback is appropriate, as are the materials, form, and orientation. A walkway should be added from the front porch to the sidewalk. The application does include a DADU, which meets all of the design guidelines. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the application with the conditions on the screen and in your report. The applicant is present and wishes to speak. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Applicant, please announce yourself. The applicant is patching in now. Just give us ah, a few seconds. Okay. I think you heard Ms. Ziegler. Our applicant is trying to patch in. Mr. Hodge, just any time. Yep. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Mitch Hodge. I'm, I'm the architect. I apologize for the delay. Technology is not my friend. No worries. Um, yeah, uh, the owners have this. I've been working with the owners on this. They've had this property since 2009, and um, they want to build their personal residence on it. Uh, this is This is essentially their forever home. So they wanted most of the living space on the main floor. They also wanted to keep the size fairly modest within the neighborhood. Um, it's a it's a shallower lot, 140 feet deep. So we wanted to preserve a lot of the yard space. Um, so stylistically, um, you know, we have the options. Most of what gets built new seems to be a bungalow or a four square. Uh, they want to do something differently, but not so out of place in the neighborhood. Um, I suggested a federal style home, which there are a couple of examples around. Um, there's some around uh, Music Row there. Uh, these homes are um, pretty modest two-story brick homes. They're just one room deep. Uh, again, these are, these are some of the earlier homes in Nashville. Um, so we wanted to start working from that form. And then uh, from there, we're stepping back um, the math thing, you know, stepping in as if it were an addition. Um, so again, we have the more the two story called the historical part of the home and we're adding on back there. Um, this allows them to get the spaces they need on the main floor that they need with some with a few spaces upstairs. Also, um, the width of the home um, again, because the, the primary roof form is or the primary form is just one room deep, just 16 feet is um, it allows us to get in the rooms um that they need um you know to fit to fit their needs um reducing the width of that is 
frankly, um, going more towards a, I would say more a four square home, it would be slightly narrower, but then it would be double the, double the depth of that. And um, I believe it would, something like that would look even more bulkier than, than what we're proposing. Um, the advantage of going with this one roof, one room depth structure, it allows us to keep the, the roof form fairly minimal. It's only spanning 16 feet. Again, we're, you know, we're, we're going 16 feet back, then stepping in um, and treating that like an addition. So that's, that's where we would like um, to ask an exception to this width. Uh, most homes are, you know, much deeper than this, obviously. Um, and I'll, I'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Okay, any uh, public comments coming in? No callers. Okay, no callers. We'll close public hearing. Commissioners? Commissioner Johnson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think I read stuff report correctly, but I want to ask again. So the width of this uh, little under 37 feet is, does it make sort of out of character kind of largest uh, width house in that, you know, uh, neighborhood in that block? Right, it's an interesting condition because they are proposing for this house to be just under 37 feet wide in a two-story form. All of the other two-story houses in this immediate context um, are narrower, the maximum width of around 32 or 33 feet. There are some one or one and a half story houses that are a bit wider, um, but we just felt like having a two-story form and then also matching um, the width of the widest one-story houses, we were just afraid that that com combining those two um, features was going to create a massing that wasn't seen anywhere else. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I understand you that know, sometimes a homeowner would have certain needs and want, but I think that's the uh, thing we have to kind of protect and preserve because that's the beauty of you know, historic zoning character. So as much as I am uh, sympathetic with owner's needs and want, I am uh, heavily inclining to staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Fitz. Um, yes, I want to, to second uh, what, um, what Commissioner um, Johnson has said, and while I really do appreciate the applicant's uh, approach and strategy here, I do see what they're trying to achieve by the less depth of the main form and the greater width um, of the house, yet given kind of given our guidelines and looking at the context I I also believe that the the width of this home is is too wide given the um, given kind of the average along the street and for a two story form. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Jones. Yes, um, I agree with uh, Commissioners Johnson and Fitz and seeing no other hands raised um, from the Commission, I uh, will go ahead and pose a motion um, for 1016 15th Avenue South that we uh, move to approve this project um, with all uh, listed staff recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Fitz. I second that. Okay, there's a first and a second, and I will take the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhaw. Yes. 
Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you. We will go next to 1417 Russell Street. And again, the public can call in to 629-255-1911. And Ms. Baldock will be our presenter. 1417 Russell was a circa 1920, one-story, full Victorian house. The house was significantly damaged in the March 3rd, 2020 tornado. In October 2020, MHCC staff issued an emergency demolition permit. The applicant proposes to construct infill and an outbuilding on the lot. The proposed infill and outbuilding meet all base zoning setbacks. The front setbacks meets the historic context. The proposed infill will be 30 feet, 10 inches wide at the front and 35 feet further back. While these widths are wider than the historic house next door at 1415B Russell Street, they are in keeping with the historic houses and the wider historic context along Holly Street and further east and west along Russell Street. Staff further finds that the width to be appropriate because the house is a true one story house. So the overall massing is scaled to meet the wider historic context. Even though there's a front dormer, there is no upstairs space in this house. The infill will have a ridge height of approximately 23, eight inches from grade at the front, which does meet the historic context. Here are the side elevations for the proposed garage. The infill's roof form materials and orientation all meet the design guidelines. Here are the remaining garage plans. And here are some context photos. So the first one at the top is directly across the street, which is a non-contributing apartment complex. The middle picture shows the house that was um, the damage in the tornado on the corner and then next door, the remaining historic house at 1417 Russell. Um, and then all of the other houses on the other side of that orangish yellow house, um, the next big kind of line of them are all non-contributing and um, where many of them were constructed um, with the commission's approval as info. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, here are some um, photographs from the houses, which are all non-contributing across um, 15th Street from the site. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval with the conditions that you see here on the screen. These are pretty much our standard conditions about inspections and staff's approval of um, um, materials and location of utilities and HVAC. Thank you, Ms. Baldock. And would the applicant be on the line? Okay, seeing that the applicant, uh, let's make sure that someone's not calling in. No, we do have a caller, but he's not the applicant. Okay, all right, perhaps the applicant may call in in a minute. But we'll take the we'll take the public comment now. And please announce your name. Good afternoon, applicant. Please announce yourself. or not the applicant, but public comment. Okay, Mr. Hawkins. And we'll give you a moment. Yes, am I to speak now? Yes, please announce yourself. Okay, hi, uh, this is John Hawkins. Um, next door is the 1415B Russell that is 474. Okay, let's, uh, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Can you just uh, repeat your name one more time? Yes, ma'am, it's John Hawkins. Okay, very good, thank you. 
Yes, you you may um, give us your comment, please. Okay, sure. Um, so I live next door in the house 1415B Russell Street, and uh, my house is the only uh, adjoining historical home on the in the the immediate vicinity of the next door house. My main concern is the massing of the proposed house at 1417 being wider and taller than my house um, and casting a shadow as the sun rises in the east, comes across the front of the house, it sets in the, to the left side of the house, um, blocking most of the sun during the day. Um, and, uh, also, it being wider and taller um, than, than the house, both the house that was there before uh, the tornado and also than my house. Um, so those are the, my main two concerns. Uh, other ones, um, with the provision that it's a two-story garage, and there's no historic homes in the area that have a two-story garage with a room above it. Um, so that's another concern. It's just the width, the, the height, and the sizing, the overall massing of the property is not consistent with um, historical code. Mr. Hawkins, what's your address again? 1450. So you're to the left of the project? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's the, the gold colored um, house. The, the color was painted before the tornado. Um, everyone on our street got hit by the tornado and um, my house has been fixed up since then, and the 1417 house has been abandoned since the tornado a year ago. Um, okay. We, we're, we're very glad that your house is back back up and that you were not yeah. uh, harmed during the tornado. The, okay. One other thing I'd like to One other thing. Can I say one more thing? Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, I just want to say that I appreciate the historical commission um, for trying to keep things, you know, in in context of the the feel and the look of the neighborhood. When natural disasters happen, um, is developers coming in buying this property and totally changing the the look and the feel of the neighborhood? And this happened two doors down from me, um, with a house that was approved by the historical commission. Um, that doesn't fit the neighborhood whatsoever and is about three or four times the size of my house and the immediate houses beside it. And um, I was worried about that happening with this house, and I just wanted something, you know, reasonable and that fits in the massing and context of, of, of uh, my house and other houses that are historical, you know, of the same era, um, and just developers not to get us you know, special treatment versus the people that have lived here for 10, 15, 20 years. And uh, otherwise, I appreciate, you know, consideration and uh, I'll accept whatever. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Hawkins. And, and duly noted. Okay, any other public comments? Okay, we have no other call-ins and I'll close public hearing. Commissioners? Commissioner Price. Yes, uh, this is a question for staff. Um, I am um, sensitive to the public uh, comment that we just had from the neighbor. Could you remind us uh, what was the height of the and width of the original house compared to what's proposed? Yes. Um, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm hitting the wrong wrong way on the PowerPoint. So I'm trying to get back to the uh, drawing so we can look at this. Um, Understood. Sure. Um, the um, height at the front will be about. Um, uh, sorry, give me a second. I'm having too many things up at once. Um, uh, the, 
Yeah, it'll be, uh, so the width, I'll start with the width. The width is 30 feet, 10 inches at the front, and then it expands wider to be 35 feet further back. And then the height is um, about 23 feet, eight inches at the front. Um, that's including the foundation. There is some slope to the site. So um, the site kind of slopes up towards the back. So that 23 feet, eight inches is pretty much the maximum height for the house. I don't know if I have in front of me because I'm sharing the PowerPoint. I can't really look things up easily on my computer. So um, I don't have in front of me the information for how tall the existing house was um the one that was you know damaged by the tornado um it was quite narrow and you know shorter than this one um, yeah 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 i guess uh while i am since like i said i'm sensitive to the neighbor's concerns overall this house appears to um not be overly large i mean it is a true one story uh it seems to fit the wider context beyond just the immediate neighbor um in terms of the rest of the street and surrounding streets so um i don't think i have i, I don't have a large i don't have any big problems with it so i, I welcome other commissioners comments or, or thoughts thank you commissioner commissioner uh vice chair stewart uh, you know this uh it's truly heartbreaking to see the pictures of the houses on the street and the devastation uh, on the street uh, to from the tornado and, and especially to this house, which was such a, a wonderful 1920s example of uh, Victorian folk architecture. I, I do hear the neighbor's comment and but uh, but I don't know that uh, today's lifestyles uh, would would live as well on the 1920s Victorian folk as, as in a, a, a somewhat larger structure. I appreciate the fact that one story, a true one story house with this, I think with it being a corner lot, uh, the larger footprint uh, is appropriate and, uh, and certainly not radically different from many of the other houses that have been built more recently on the street. So uh, I have two, uh, tend to uh, to agree with the uh, staff recommendations regarding uh, the approval of this project. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, sorry, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I echo the uh, previous commissioner's comment. Uh, you know, of course, we are very sensitive about our neighbors' uh, input and comment and so forth. But I do believe uh, staff recommendation and analysis is right on with the historical context. So if no other commissioner has any comment on in regards to 1417 Russell Street, I make motion to accept staff recommendation with conditions. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Fitz. I would like to second that motion. Okay. There's a first and second. I will take the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Thank you. We'll move on to 1812 Holly Street. Again, the public can call in to 629-255-1911 and Mr. Alexander will be our presenter. Anywhere. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to maintain social distance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, An historic house at 1812 Holly Street was destroyed by the tornado and on March 3rd of last year, and a demolition permit was subsequently issued. 
This is a proposal to construct a new one and one half story house, replacing the one that was demolished and to build a DADU at the rear of the lot. As outlined in the staff recommendation, the proposal meets the design guidelines. Staff recommends approval of the proposed infill and outbuilding with the conditions outlined in the staff recommendation, which are shown on the screen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. And the applicant is on the line. Please announce yourself. Uh, yes, this is Hunter Conley uh, with Allard Ward Architects. I'm also joined here by Michael Ward. Uh, we really just wanted to take the time to thank staff for their insight on not only this project, but all of our historic projects. Uh, for 1812 Holly specifically, we were provided a pretty clear guideline for any infill construction. And we did our best to adhere to those design parameters as closely as possible. Uh, we maintained appropriate proportions as set, place, set in place by staff and replicated as many motifs from the previous home and neighboring home as possible while still creating what we feel is a desirable and contemporary home. Uh, in turn, we feel as though that this house is one that's going to blend with its surroundings and neighborhood context as Holly Street continues to rebuild and regrow throughout the years. And we're available for any questions that staff may have for us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Mr. Alexander, do we have any public comment? Uh, no. Okay, no public comment. We will close public hearing. And commissioners, discussion or a motion? Vice Chair Stewart. Hi, Madam Chairman, uh, this uh, is a well done addition uh, to this neighborhood. Again, regret the tornado damage, but, uh, but with respect uh, to uh, 1812 Holly Street, I recommend uh, I make a motion for approval uh, with staff conditions. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Second the motion. Okay, there's a first and a second, and I will take the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall? Yes. Commissioner Mosley? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Williams? Yes. Okay, thank you. We will hear our next project, which is 1830 5th Avenue North. And the public call in number is 629 255 1911. And Ms. Sodget will be our presenter. The application is for duplex infill and two single story outbuildings. Uh, the infill and outbuildings meet all setbacks except for the street setback from Coffee Street. The application includes a setback determination to reduce that 10 foot street setback um, to nine feet from the infill and five feet six inches for the outbuilding nearest to the corner. Uh, staff finds both setbacks to be appropriate for the historic context and similar to setback determinations approved by the commission for nearby corner lots. The proposed infill meets all the design guidelines and is appropriate for the historic context. It's two stories and includes a wraparound porch as well as a side porch on Coffee Street. Uh, here are the interior side and the rear elevation. And here are the elevations for the, the one story outbuildings, which also meet the design guidelines. Here are some context photos. The top photo shows houses across Coffee Street and the bottom photo shows houses directly across Fifth Avenue North. And the top photo shows infill at 1825 Fifth Avenue North, which was approved in 2017, while the bottom photo shows um, houses immediately to the right of the site. In conclusion, staff recommends approval with conditions as outlined in the staff recommendation. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Sajit. And the applicant is on the line. Please announce yourself. Uh, Jeff Slightland. Yes, sir. Uh, I have no questions. Uh, further comments. Melissa did a great job. I'm here if y'all have any questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Any public comment call in? Okay. No call ins. We will close public hearing. Commissioners, discussion or a motion? 
Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, express my appreciation to uh, the applicant uh, designer. I think this house really taken advantage of the corner house and then entry is each corner. So I really appreciate not uh, introducing tall and skinny into that a lot. And so this creative duplex and with his strict con content is really appreciated. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, there are two commissioners that have unmuted, however, don't see a hand. Okay, Vice Chair Stewart. Madam Chairman, uh, Madam Chairwoman, with the respect to 1835th Avenue North, uh, I recommend approval with staff conditions. Thank you, sir. There is a motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Williams. I second the motion. Yes, sir. We have a first, we have a second. We will take the roll. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhall. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. And Commissioner Williams. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. And I will turn it over to Ms. Ziegler. Mr. Dickerson. And Mr. Dickerson. Okay, we don't have any new business. So our council, Alex Dickerson. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. The last item on your agenda, which was, by the way, this is Alex Dickerson. Uh, the last item on your agenda, which was pushed here, because um, I was a little bit late today, is for 1501 Fatherland. If you'll recall, this was a demolition case where uh, the staff recommended approval of the application. Uh, the commission ultimately denied the application four to one, uh, and then the applicant filed a statutory writ certiorari to the Chancery Court. Uh, the court is, was empowered to and did uh, reverse the judgment of the commission, uh, finding that the decision of the commission to deny the application was not supported and that the applicant had demonstrated an economic financial hardship through, its, through the guidelines um, established by an ordinance. So the exact language of what the court ordered, which is really all that the commission is responsible for carrying out, is that the court <clears throat> remands this matter to the commission with instructions to issue Mr. Duckworth a demolition permit in accordance with this memorandum and order and in keeping with the commission's procedures. So that's what the, what the, what the court required and that's what we would advise that the commission do. Okay. So, Mr. Dickerson, so we need to make a motion to approve the demolition. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. We will move on that motion and uh, Commissioner Price. Yes. Um, I don't know if anybody else has comments. I have a lot on this case. Uh, I did want to ask Mr. Dickerson real quickly. Um, so an applicant can appeal our decision, but if we disagree with the judge or the chancellor in this case, there's no there's no way for us to appeal that any further, correct? No, um, we, that, this the decision of the judge can be appealed uh, to uh, the Court of Appeals. Um, in this case, we have had uh, the counsel of record, the, the Metro attorney that handled that case, Mr. Brooke Fox, um, he advised that this decision um, did not have any precedential value in the way it was issued. It was, it was basically um, not one that would uh, confine the commission going forward. And so he advised um, that an appeal would, would probably not be appropriate in this case. Um, and so I believe that's what the, um, the, the decision was from the staff's perspective. So now uh, I suppose it's entirely possible that the um, commission could um, refuse to, do, to carry out the court's order or direct that we appeal that, um, and that's, um, I, I could report that back to, um, to Brooke. Ultimately, the Department of Law is, has the responsibility of deciding what to appeal or not, but we certainly take into account what the client wants to do. Um, so that's, that's the kind of position we're in. It's, it's not a, as clean of an answer as I, as I wish I could give you, but 
um, that's where we are. No, uh, that, that's good to know. And I appreciate that. Um, so I, I wrote, wrote myself some notes. The more I read, read this decision and, and all the circumstances of this case, the more I, I want to express you know, my feelings about it. So uh, I'll share those before we go. Um, I will vote to do you know, what, what the court is, is telling us to do, but I do want to note, first, I, I find this ruling to be a travesty. I think the judge absolutely gets, gets this wrong uh, about economic hardship. I think the analysis is totally flawed and sets a dangerous precedent for other investor uh, house flipper types, which is what this, um, this applicant is uh, for working in our, in our districts. Um, I think that this, this case hinges on the fact that he engaged in a risky financial move to buy this house that had clear structural issues that should have been obvious to him from the outset. And, uh, you know, reading through the ruling, um, essentially what he did is he overpaid for a house that had structural issues. And then in the ruling, you know, it, it, there's this discussion about the, the value of the house and comparables nearby and, and how everything about our economic hardship analysis sort of hinges on, on those comparables and what this house was worth in determining whether or not you have a hardship. Well, I'd be willing to bet that those other comparables did not have these structural problems. So they weren't in fact comparable, right? And so he essentially, what he did is he over, he, he made a bet that he was going to be able to, to renovate this house and, and then found out that uh, without doing his due diligence, that he would not be able to do that and sort of has, in my opinion, abused the economic hardship argument in order to secure a demolition permit. Um, so in, in my opinion, our commission's denial of the permit of the demolition permit did not result in economic hardship on the applicant. Rather, it was the fact that he overpaid for a house that needed significant structural work resulted in a self-imposed economic hardship. So uh, I, I just, when I read the judge's ruling that, that, our, that our denial was um, arbitrary and capricious, it just, it just raises the hair on, my, on the back of my neck because I think that our, the denial was absolutely within the letter of the design guidelines and uh, prevention for preventing demolitions of historic contributing homes in our neighborhoods. Um, and so, so anyway, that's, that's my opinion. And, and, and should a similar case come up with another investor owner, I will again vote with, with similar circumstances, I will again vote to deny the, the demolition permit. So uh, those, those are my thoughts. I, I, thank you very much. Commissioner Price, as you noted, um, I do have a question for Alex Dickerson. This is Chair Bell. Is that, and I think it's rare that we get these cases. And I think in terms of our, our legal procedure that you could um, guide us in this, like, what if we say, what, what if the commission body says, we don't, we don't agree? Just, just like, you know, if that would be the case, what happens? Well, um, so I would say that, first of all, we'd have to see what our time for appeal is, because that's going to be relevant to this. Um, if the time has expired, um, then first of all, again, this is, uh, you're, you, could, you could decide uh, not to enforce it, but we would strongly recommend against that, especially if the appeal isn't going to happen. Um, there's not a deadline in the order for issuing the permit, um, but you'd want to do that as soon as the decision was made not to appeal it. And I guess I would, um, it might be a, a good question for Ms. Ziegler, um, if, because this is a little bit separate and apart from what we do. Ms. Ziegler, have you had a conversation with Mr. Fox about the deadline to appeal? Do you know um, if that's passed or not? We have not. Okay, all right. So, um, I'd have to I'd have to look and see what when the deadline is, but assuming it's expired, there's no other option than to to vote this. Um, and if you if the commission decided not to approve it, then you'd be in violation of a court order. Um, if on the other hand the appeal deadline hasn't run, um, we could always look at the possibility of appeal. But again, that's the the director of law's decision. Um, even sometimes we have to make legal decisions that may be different than the commission to enact the votes. So. 
um, that's kind of the position you're in. But I, without knowing the deadline for appeal, which I'll try to look up real quick, um, I, I can't really say whether or not you all even have any options. Okay. Commissioners, um, you know, I, I, I uh, did see this house as well. I did take an on-site. Um, I do lean on Commissioner Price's comments because, you know, we, we come up on these kind of situations where, and, and, you know, we got comment from the Neighborhood Association, we got comment from Councilman Withers on uh, this is a difficult, um, you know, project. And, and yet there were people who had positive um, facts about about this project. So, yeah, it it makes our it makes our job more challenging. We're always conscious about how we set precedents with someone else coming in and doing that. I mean, we've had some demolitions, and they've been worthy to you know, to process. Um, Vice Chair Stewart. Um, and as I give these comments, could we get, the, is there a motion that legal has put together uh, for us to act on that's that's on this? Because I know that when they were describing that, it had more than one part. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we could get some clarity from from legal on that, that would be helpful. But th I, I agree with Commissioner Price. And I think that this was a very difficult uh, issue and a number of us went out and spent a fair amount of time at the site. All of us reviewed reports and other reports. Uh, we listened to contractors, we listened to neighbors, neighborhood association, uh, council people, um, and, uh, and, and a number, you know, we we really went through a lot of information in deliberation of, of this uh, issue. And uh, I, I do think though that there is uh, something to be said for the, the limited resources and acknowledging that what Metro has and the historic commission. And I think that with respect to this one, I think although it could be appealed uh, depending on what the time frame is for the appeal, uh, I think our resources would be better to save them for a, a different issue. Uh, legal has said that this would not create a precedent for the future. And I think this has been something that I, I think uh, will inform future decisions for us uh, as we proceed with these. But uh, but, but I, I do tend to agree that uh, that given the judge's ruling and direction to us, that the appropriate thing is for us to um, to take that appropriate action. Mm -hmm. Duly noted, Vice Chair. Commissioners, any other comments, please? Madam Chair, if I could, uh, to answer a couple of those questions, this is Alex Dickerson. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, first of all, I found out that the order, the memorandum and order was issued on January 5th, and there's 30 days to appeal the final order. So um, the way it works in, and Chancery Court is you get a memorandum and order and then a final judgment will be entered usually that day or a few days later. So it's very likely that the time for appeal ran for this on in the early part of February, although I can't confirm that for sure. Um, and as far as the motion that you'd simply just be moving to approve the demolition application. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Price. Yes, uh, I agree with with uh, Vice Chair Stewart that this, I mean, our, our hands are tied here. We need to do it. Uh, I guess we need to do it now, um, especially given what Mr. Dickerson just said about the, the time for appeal. Mm -hmm. I just want, right. I'd like to have an agreement among the, the board, the commission, and then also the staff to take a real hard look in the future when people are, are making these economic uh, hardship cases. Because I, I, I honestly think that this this is not a case of economic hardship. It's a it's a self imposed economic hardship, and so I I I would I just want to I want to put the screws to people in the future um, when this the sets of circumstances come together like like this one. So that's that's all I got to say. Otherwise, I'm I'm ready to go ahead and uh, hear a motion. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Commissioner Mosley. 
Um, I guess if we are, we are we continue to be called to, to order, and so this conversation can continue after um, after a motion and a vote. But I, I would echo the um, comments of Commissioner Price. In and I feel like we often find ourselves um, pouring over dish issues in economic hardship cases that perhaps are not relevant to um, structural integrity and, in other words, the economics and, and the discussion of integrity are, are not always uh, congruent with each other and, and perhaps our approach within the legal framework that we have to, within which we have to operate, we may need to um, adjust that uh, with some input from legal as to something that is both defensible and perhaps a higher bar. Agreed. Commissioner. Yes. Okay. Um, well, then, well said, everyone. And let's just move on this motion. And then if we want to have more discussion and maybe, you know, that could be another CLG kind of thing where Really, it's a bigger, bigger thing about having economic hardship guidelines, you know, have a stronger uh, backbone about it. Um, okay, that was Chair Bell. Uh, Commissioner Mosley. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to continue on that because I know we've, we've heard from staff in the past that, you know, there's not, um, someone we can hire um, to be an outside source for here's, you know, another comp for the economic hardship. That That is one of those things, right, Ms. Ziegler, is um, to have that resource. And so I think that's one of our maybe charges that we could strengthen our that credibility. Um, so those are thoughts for for our commission and um, we have some really good resources here. Uh, we have a good, we have a good group guys and gals. <laughs> so um, I think we, we're, we're pretty sensitive to demos and I think we, we need to have some more conversation about that. Okay. Um, Pers uh, Commissioner Mosley. Sure. Yeah, pursuant yes, to the order of the Pursuant to the order of the court, uh, with respect to 1501 Fatherland, um, I submit um, an application, or not submit an application, I um, move to approve the application for demolition. Okay. There's a motion. Vice Chair Stewart. I second the motion. Okay. There's a first and a second. And we do this under duress. <laughs> so we call for the call for the vote. Vice Chair Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Fitz. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Mayhoff. Yes. Commissioner Mosley. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. Okay. Well, we have our work to do, don't we? <laughs> and um, we might have some coming up pretty soon. So be on, be prepared. Um, Robin, is there anything else? No, we have nothing else. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Alex, anything else? Not for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well done, group. And we might. Robin, what do you think about, oh, might be virtual next time or what? We haven't heard yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Likely, all likely virtual. This is Alex Dickerson. Likely virtual. We've heard that it'll be extended, the executive order between 30 and 60 days. Not sure which. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate you all very much. Be safe. Thanks. Thank you.
This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.